Father, you, we hear your heart here. We hear your desire for us not to perish. It does not please you when man chooses sin and dies in his sin. You said it brings you great pleasure when we repent and follow Christ and have life. I fear, Lord, that many will gather on a Sunday like this and not hear you. We want you to be magnified during this time. We want Christ to be known. We want hearts to be rightly changed. But that requires our hearing you. So speak to us, Father, please. So many distractions, so much noise, so many things running around in our head. We ask that during this time, during this sacred gathering, that you, O Holy Spirit, would move in such a way that we would hear you speak. And in so doing, Lord, be forever changed. We praise you for being a God that does not give up on us when we give up on you. We praise you for being a God who, who came to us when we were dead in our sins and you had to make us alive. And so here we are, alive in Christ. Speak to us, Father, please. Let my brothers and sisters hear your word as I've heard you speak to me this week. I ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Good morning. If you have a Bible and you haven't opened up already to Ezekiel chapter 33, please do so. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 33 is a passage many of you know well. You've probably heard it preached on. It is a it is a pastor's passage. We're not going to be doing Ezekiel in our next series. So if, if I'm confusing you, I apologize. We're going to be doing Joel in our next series. A minor prophet. Some think he's one of the earliest prophets to speak. We'll talk more about that. Um, it's a phenomenal book in the minor prophets that talks about God's judgment and then God calling for repentance, and God showing mercy upon his people. It's only three chapters, but I think we're going to be there for a little bit, and, and I have an idea that we're going to be extremely blessed by it. I wanted to introduce Joel with Ezekiel. Why are you here this morning? Why gather to hear a man preach? Many of you are here Sunday after Sunday. Many of you have been here Sunday after Sunday for years doing this, gathering, and singing, and praying, and hearing the word preached. Why should you come for the next five, six, seven, eight weeks and listen to me preach to you from an Old Testament book that is centuries old. Certainly there must be something more relevant that I could talk about to you than a book from the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament. I want to ask that question this morning. Why are we here? Why am I preaching? Why are you listening? Because I want us to get this right before we start Joel next week. Lest you dismiss it as a minor prophet in the wrong sense. And do not have an ear to hear what God has to say to you. 
So I want to answer some of these questions, why we're here, why you're listening, why I'm preaching from this book by looking at Ezekiel, 11 verses in chapter 33. Now this is hard to do whenever you, you're trying to take a sermon without developing the context, it becomes very dangerous. So I want to tell you just briefly about Ezekiel. He is a prophet in the Old Testament. He's considered one of the major prophets, not because he was more important than Joel, but because he wrote more than Joel. The major and the minors would distinguish upon the quantity in which they wrote, not on their status or their message. Ezekiel was a prophet who went into Babylonian exile sometime 597, 598 B.C. with King Jehoiakim. That was the very beginning of Judah being under siege by the Babylonians. It lasted 10 years until the final group was taken out in 586 B.C. and the city was destroyed and the temple was left in ruin and God's people geographically were no more. In 722, if you remember, the Assyrians attacked the northern ten tribes known as Israel. So they're gone already. And by 586, Judah had been taken also into, into captivity in Babylon. So there is no more nation of Israel. No more tribes occupying the promised land that was made to Abraham centuries before. And with Judah falling, the people had to ask is the covenant promise broken? Was what God promised to Abraham, is that not true? We are no longer a people in a land. We no longer have the temple. We no longer have walls to protect us. Are we no longer God's people? This is what they were asking in the time of Ezekiel in Babylon in captivity. Now you might think that being in captivity Many of them would have been compelled to believe now the prophecies made by Jeremiah. They were told, if you rebel, if you continue to sin, if you continue to worship idols, God will bring his hand against you. He will judge you. So you would think that that would, that would come into their thinking. But look at verse 10 with me here. Instead of believing now, there's a sense of disbelief and a strange fatalism that has come upon God's people in captivity. Verse 10 they're saying to themselves here, latter part of verse 10, surely, these are the exiles, the Jewish exiles in Babylon, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? They see no hope in their situation. And so God raises up Ezekiel. He raises up Ezekiel to speak a message of life and hope in, to a people that are in the midst of a foreign land. They are surrounded, now listen, they are surrounded by people who do not know God and do not believe in God. That sound familiar? Does that sound familiar for us today? They are foreigners in a foreign land. And so God wants to raise up a man, Ezekiel, and remind them, this is not your end. This is not where God's story ends. It does not end in a colony in Babylon with the Jews. God brings Ezekiel to remind them of the promise, a great promise of hope that the people would be redeemed, the land would be restored, the temple would be understood differently in the context of man and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And so he calls Ezekiel to speak. From this passage, I want us to see three things from the watchmen that we will take into next week as we hear Joel speak, and by God's grace, hear God speak through him. Three things. Number one, a watchman's warning. Number two, every man's culpability. And number three, God's good pleasure. The warning, the culpability, and the pleasure of God. Let's look at a watchman's warning first. Look with me at verse 1, please. Ezekiel 33, verse 1. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel speaking. And here God now speaks. God, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, if I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman... And if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, verse 4, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, 
and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his head. Verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. If he had taken warning, he would have lived. Now in verse 7, Ezekiel is made a watchman by God. Look at verse 7. So you, this is not just a message for Ezekiel to hear and go tell the people. He's saying, this is your message. You are the watchman. Verse 7, so you, son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. You say, well, what, what is a watchman? Is it someone who makes watches, someone who sells watches. What is a watchman? The term is self-explanatory. It's someone who's watching over something. In the time of Ezekiel's day and in the time of the prophets, it was someone who watched over a people or watched over a city. It was usually a civil servant that was assigned the task of finding a very high point on the wall, on a tower, sometimes on the mountaintop. And they would look as far as they could see on the horizon to look for an enemy that was coming against them. And if they saw an enemy, look at verse 3. What would they do? They would blow the trumpet and they would warn the people. They would blow the trumpet and say, you either need to flee or you need to fight because an enemy is coming. We need to prepare. That was the job of the watchman. Now, Ezekiel was called to be God's watchman, a spiritual watchman. He was not literally sitting up on a mountaintop looking for a physical enemy. His eyes were upon the eternal horizon and he was looking for the sword of God that would come the great day of the Lord. Remember, they're already in exile. They've already been subject to Babylon. So Ezekiel here is talking about the great day of the Lord, of which the Babylonian captivity was only a taste, a foreshadowing of what was to come. And the watchman had a job. It was to bring a message, to hear God speak, and then to speak on his behalf. Look at the latter part of verse 7. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, God is speaking to Ezekiel, whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. In other words, the words of the watchman are not his own words. The words of the watchman are God's words. The watchman does not speak on his own behalf. He speaks upon God's behalf. He is responsible for hearing and then speaking so that God's people might hear God, not him, not any man. It wasn't his own words, not his own thoughts, not his own feelings, not his own opinions. Look back at verse 2 with me. He says, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them what? Speak to your people and say to them what you think we ought to do. No. Speak to your people and tell them of the great work that you're going to do, your opinions, your understanding of the situation. No. He then says, you speak to him what I'm going to tell you. And Ezekiel did. Ezekiel spoke on behalf of God. I did not spend this week studying and praying over this sermon to bring a lecture to you. I have nothing to say to you other than what God has spoken in the Word of God. I have nothing. I don't even care for my own opinions. I certainly wouldn't want to, sh to share them with you. God has something to say through His Word to those who will open their mouth and preach the gospel of grace. And so here we have, I believe, a very compelling reason to be here on a Sunday morning a compelling reason for all people, saved and unsaved, to gather before a pulpit where God's word will be opened and preached. Because God is the one speaking. Every ordained pastor, every ordained pastor is a watchman for God. Their job is to speak on his behalf. It means that during the week they will die to themselves they will open up God's word daily. They will, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, try to understand it, try to work through it, and then come before God's people and say, thus saith the Lord. Did you come here with that expectation? Yes. Praise God, brother. Not to hear Pastor Keith preach anything, but to hear God speak to you through me. I'm a voice piece. Completely expendable. You need to hear God.
We need pastors who will speak what God has to say, not man-made wisdom. Not that which the book of Proverbs says is foolish and leads unto death. We need to hear from God's mouth as he has spoken through his sacred word, proclaimed faithfully week after week after week. The watchmen are messengers. It is a lowly task to just speak what God has said, whether it's good or bad. Do you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 4, do you remember when the Philistines had successfully defeated the Israelites and they captured the Ark of the Covenant and Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, had died in battle and they picked a man named Benjamin to travel 26 miles to go to Eli and tell him, your sons are dead, Hophni's dead, Phinehas is dead, we lost the battle, worst news of all, the Ark is gone. Eli falls over, breaks his neck and he dies because the news is so tragic. This Benjamin had a job. It was to speak the truth, and he did. The watchman's duty, regardless of the news being good or bad, is to speak on behalf of God. Now, there are many in our cultural moment, and certainly many here in the Bay Area, that see the preaching of the Word of God as either foolish or antiquated. No reason to be doing this. No reason for you to waste your time and gather on a Sunday morning and listen to a man open up the Bible and proclaim this. Foolishness. Foolishness. After all, these, these are old writings. I mean, these are old writings. We're going to be looking at a prophet if we put him somewhere in the 9th century. That's old stuff. 9th century B.C. Nothing to hear from this. Nothing to glean from this. This is the 21st century. We have technology. We have information. We don't need this. Many in our culture believe that the preaching and teaching of the Word of God is irrelevant. And I believe that is in part because many pastors and evangelical churches believe it is irrelevant, irrelevant as well. So instead of preaching the Word of God and the gospel of grace, they preach things they ought not. And people come in and they hear and think, this is not that good. I could have thought of that on my own. I could have watched that on television. I certainly could have got that online. When pastors lose confidence in the power of the Word of God, so too will those who come to hear it. Many churches this morning, people have gathered just like you, and they're hearing a counterfeit. They're not hearing the Word of God. They're not hearing about the great work of Jesus Christ. They're hearing about prosperity, maybe. They're hearing about a works-based gospel, maybe. They're hearing about cheap grace, maybe. Instead of hearing about the God of the Bible. My beloved, what else do you want to hear? What else would you want to dwell upon? What else do you want to stir your heart more than the God of the Bible? If we do not preach this, then people cannot hear. Instead of these, I want to be very gracious these topical sermons that are just, have nothing to do with Christ or the gospel or heaven or hell. I was trying this week to listen. I heard about how to earn money. I heard about how to be a better employee. I heard about life skills. If we don't preach from the word of God, then people will not hear about God's majesty and God's glory. If we do not preach from the word of God, people will not hear of the holiness of God and the depth of every man's sin and the desperate need to repent and believe and be saved. If we do not preach from the word of God, you will not know about Christ. You will not know about the sacrifice that he made. You will not know that this man came to earth as a man and he lived a perfect life and then he climbed upon that cross for you to save you. You won't hear that on how to make more money or be a better employee or gain certain life skills. Those do not matter in light of eternity. You won't hear of the great work of salvation that is by grace, unmerited favor, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. You will not hear that if you're not in the Word. You won't hear of His sacrificial death on the cross. You won't hear how by grace through faith He will take your sins and He will bear it in His body. He will bear it in His body for you so that you don't have to so you can be set free, 
so you can live, not only now, but forever. You won't hear the covenant that God made with Abraham. You won't hear the laws that were given to Moses. You won't hear the great prophecies that the prophets made for centuries. Just like here, God's saying, do not die, repent and live. If we are not here, if we are not here, we offer no hope. We offer no life. And I would agree with the culture, you ought not be here. If we are not proclaiming the word of God, then you should not be here. There are many Super Bowl parties taking place right now where you should be. And yet this is what the watchman is commanded by God to do. He says, speak my word. Declare my word. John Stott, professor and pastor and Christian author, listen to what he wrote. He said, Christian leaders should stop their dance round the golden calves of modernity. Instead of asking, what does, mo what does modern man have to say to the church? They should start asking, what does the church have to say to modern man? And resume the bold proclamation of her unchanging message. Amen, amen, amen. The message of every true watchman is God's message. And I would argue that if every pastor in the South Bay took this upon himself, that this is our job to proclaim the word of God and stop trying to be entertainers, that we would see here a movement of the Spirit in ways we've never seen. We're to speak what God has been speaking for centuries. We're not to come up with new things, new ways to bring people in, new ways to keep people here. We're supposed to preach the great gospel that has been preached for centuries. At least, my beloved, if someone comes into a gospel-preaching, word-centered church, and they hear the message and they reject it or they say it's irrelevant or they say it's antiquated, at least they'll be rejecting the word of God and Christ himself and not the noise that people ought to reject when they come into a church expecting to hear God. At least they'll be rejecting the cornerstone. 1 Peter 2.8, God's son, Jesus Christ, is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. It grieves me. It grieves me every Sunday to know that there are thousands of people in so-called houses of worship listening to pastors pacify them with vain platitudes and no message of hope. Cultural noise One author put it like this. He said, this is what the pastor's job is. Listen to this. And listen to what he describes this event. For the pastor, his throne is the pulpit. He stands in Christ's stead. His message is the word of God. Listen to this. Around him are immortal souls. The Savior unseen is beside him. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene, and heaven and hell await the issue. What associations and what a vast responsibility. Extraordinary. This meeting, Christ is present, the Holy Spirit is present, angels gaze upon this moment, and heaven and hell hang in the balance, and we're going to talk about life skills? What has happened? What has happened? Okay, so first point. First point. You're here because the watchman has a word from God. There's reason to gather on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and any chance you can to come before a pulpit that is preaching the word of God. And there are many pulpits doing that. There are. There are many men who said, enough of the culture. We will not buy in. We will preach and teach a crucified Christ until he comes or until he takes us home. Point number two, why should you be here? Why gather? Because you're culpable. You're culpable. We should gather. I should preach. You should listen. We should obey because we are culpable before this thrice holy God. Look at verse 3.
If he, the watchman, if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone hears the sound of the trumpet, does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. The sword is God's judgment. You probably know that. You probably see that from the text. In Ezekiel's day, they're already in exile, right? The judgment had already come. God used the Babylonians to exercise judgment upon Judah for their sins and for their perpetual idolatry. He had warned them in Jeremiah and said, stop, 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 and they did not stop. And so the Babylonians came. In Joel's prophecy next week, you're going to see that he brought locusts, and the locusts came in, and they devoured everything in the land. The sword that Ezekiel is speaking of right here is the great day of the Lord. It is the day of judgment. It is the day when every man, woman, and child will stand before God and have to give an account. Now, you might be thinking, if you're reasoning through this text, you might be saying, but it's God's sword. I mean, you said in verse 2, it says, God is speaking, if I bring the sword upon the land. You say, well, instead of sending a watchman like you, which is pathetic, and I would agree, instead of sending a man to speak on God's behalf, why doesn't he just not bring the sword? Why not just not have the judgment? Then we don't need a watchman, and we don't have to worry about who's going to listen and who's not going to listen to you, oh man. You might say, well, it's his sword, and he is God, so he can put it away. It's his sword, and he is God, and therefore he cannot. He is God. And because he is God, he is good, and he is just, and by his very nature, he must punish every single sin. He cannot not punish sin because of who he is. To simply let sin and rebellion go, to let justice not be served would be like like a, a contemporary judge in a court of law having a convicted murderer or rapist or kidnapper just go without punishment. You would say, that is no good judge, and you are right. But God is a good judge. He's a perfectly good judge. He is infinitely perfect in his holiness and in his justice, and therefore he cannot not bring the sword against man's rebellion. He must bring it. But according to the Bible, God is also infinitely gracious. He is holy and he is gracious. And so we see that in his sending the watchmen. He sends the watchmen to warn us that the judgment day is coming, the sword is coming, that we might not be swept away. He says, listen to my watchmen. Listen to what they say. Look at verse 4 again. If anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. You heard the warning. And then in verse 5, the latter part of verse 5, he says, but if he, the person who heard it, had taken warning, he would have saved his life. He would have saved his life. Eternal life and death. Heaven and hell, my beloved, is what truly hangs in the balance at this moment for every man, woman, and child on this planet. 7.6 billion people stand at the precipice of eternity looking upon one of those two eternal destinations, heaven or hell, damnation or eternal life. I read this week that the networks are projecting, projecting 115 million Americans will be sitting down this afternoon to watch the Super Bowl. That's a third of the population. Tuning in to, is it NBC? I think it's NBC. Don't correct me. NBC, listening to their broadcasters, listening to their watchmen talk about a game. When I think about those numbers, listening to broadcasters talk about a game, and how many will be watching this afternoon this game that now defines our culture, having never heard a watchman proclaim the gospel of grace, never heard about the holiness of God or the depth of their sin or their need to be saved. And how many more watching the game this afternoon will have heard that and rejected it? They turned away instead of heeding the warning and having life. 
for those who refuse to hear the trumpet, for those who refuse to heed the warning, the sword will come and it will sweep them away into eternity. Or there is the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. And the Bible says here very clearly, their blood will be on their heads. They've sinned against God. God is rightly judging them. God sent a messenger. He sends a watchman to bring the gospel. They do not want to believe, and so they perish. Culpable now, forever culpable. But this is not God's desire. Look at the latter part of verse 5 again. But if he had taken warning, if the man who is doomed to perish takes warning, he would have saved his life. Say, well, what warning could that have been? What warning? Does a watchman speak on behalf of God that has the power to save a soul from eternity in hell? What is that warning? Right before our Lord's ascension in Luke chapter 24, listen to what he says to his disciples. This is right before he leaves to ascend to the right hand of the Father. This is Jesus now, Luke 24, verse 46. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That is the message, the message for the watchman, to all the nations, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins is offered through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our problem, is it not? That's my problem. That's your problem. That's the problem for 7.6 billion people on this planet right now is our sins against a holy God. The Bible says that those sins result in death. That the wages of sin is death. The consequence of our sin against God without a Savior, without Christ, is an eternity of death forever and ever. According to God's perfect law of righteousness, whether you believe this or not, you need to hear it because this is the message. You have sinned against this holy God tens of thousands of times. And you are, even if you haven't lived long, even in your short life, you are deserving of an eternity in hell forever and ever. Deserving of being condemned. Deserving of being rightly judged by a just God. But along with this warning which should cause every ear to stop. God says there's a way of life. If you take the warning, you will save your life. You say, well, how is that possible? Because Christ came, he heard the warning, and he took the punishment on your behalf. The consummate messenger was not Ezekiel, and it's not a pastor, it's Jesus Christ. And Christ came and proclaimed the same message, did he not? The first words recorded out of his mouth are what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He brought the first message. Christ the Messiah. He says, believe in me. Put your trust in me. I will go to that cross, and I will have my body broken, and I will have my blood spilled, so that I will receive the full wrath from my Father that you rightly deserved. And if you trust in me, no works, no religion, no reading your Bible, taking communion, going to church. But if you just put all your trust and all your hope in me to save you, you follow me, I will save you. Christ suffered on your behalf. Christ rose on your behalf. Christ offers salvation and life for you. Not your good life. I know that most of us are good Reformed Christians here. Not your works, Christian. Still so much you do thinking I'm in God's good grace now. I wasn't yesterday, but today's a better day. That's a false gospel. You're either in Christ or you're not. Not your good works. Not how kind you are to people. Not how often you come to church. Not how often you take communion. Not how often you read your Bible. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ. It's his work. It's his merit. It's his righteousness that has to be given to you. We just had a chance to sing that, did we not? We stand on his righteousness. My beloved, you, you have nothing else to stand on. We have nothing else to stand on if not the righteousness of Christ. John 3, 17. You know John 3, 16. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be what? 
saved through him. God the Father sent Christ that we might be saved through him. Now, you might say, what if I've never heard the message? Well, you just did. You just did. So you can't use that anymore. And you might say, well, what if I've sat under watchmen who have neglected to tell me the message? Look at verse 8 again. If I, God speaking, if I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked one, you shall surely die, and you, watchmen, do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. This is really important. Not hearing the gospel message does not erase your sins. Not coming to a church or hearing the gospel outside of the church, not hearing it does not then relieve you of the culpability of sinning before a holy God. Every man will give an account. Every man will stand before God and be judged. And if Christ is not your Savior, if you're not covered by his sacrifice, then you must be judged justly. And therefore, you will be condemned. Paul said in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God, listen to this, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Therefore, we are without excuse. Hearing the gospel, not hearing the gospel. Going to church, not going to church. We all will stand before God and give an account because we all are without excuse. The creation testifies to the majesty of God. It certainly testifies to his holiness in our own depravity. If a man perishes due to his own neglect, the guilt remains upon him. But I want you to notice something else here about the watchman, and this is a terrifying passage for me. Terrifying. Look at verse 8 again. If you, watchman, do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, his blood I will require at your hand. His blood. Every pastor, every missionary, every teacher of God's word that doesn't hear that and tremble does not understand what it is saying. This is a terrifying truth. How many pastors this morning right here in the South Bay are preaching sermons that tickle ears? Preaching sermons where they're telling people that they have peace with God when there's been no repentance, no faith, and they've not been born again. Flattery and fluff. What a horrible fate awaits them. Pray for them. You've been to some of these churches. You've heard some of these sermons. You said, what is that? Pray for them. God is saying here that they will be required to pay for the blood of those who they did not preach to. It is a horrible fate. In verse 9, it implies that their own soul will be subject to punishment. And it's not just the watchman, my beloved. How many congregations, how many congregations hire pastors who they know will not preach the word of God? They hire them specifically because they know they will not preach the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come, listen, when they, the people, will not endure sound doctrine, that's the preaching of the word of God, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they, the people, will accumulate for themselves teachers, pastors, watchmen, in accordance with their own desires. How quick we are to put together a search committee and look for a pastor who will come and tickle our ears. Not only will the watchmen be subject, but so will the congregations, many of whom who are, are, are hiring men who will forsake the word. My beloved, we are so quick. We're so quick to guard our homes. We're quick to guard our bank accounts. We're quick to guard our computers. And yet we don't spend the time guarding the church, guarding the pulpit, guarding the souls of other men. We are so quickly offended as professing Christians when we hear a pastor preach the hard truth of God's word. So quickly offended. The man of God is commanded to preach what? The full counsel of God. He can't skip over sections. Side note, if you are attending a church or listening to a pastor who skips hard sections, leave quickly. 
The full counsel of God must be preached. We are to warn. We are to correct. We are to rebuke. That is the job. That is the calling of the watchman. And yet how many evangelical churches in our backyard here would rather perish by listening to smooth talk than have the faithful proclamation of the gospel made, having their ears tickled, instead of having the word of God bring salvation and sanctification in life. All right, I know, I'm a little long, I'm sorry. You should be here because the watchman, if he's doing his job, has a word for you. Hmm? You should be here on a Sunday morning before a gospel pulpit because you're accountable. You're accountable. But I want to give you one more because if you're, if you're discouraged at all, this last point should lift you up upon eagle's wings. God's good pleasure is that you do not perish. It's God's good pleasure that you live. Look at verse 10. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, speaking, God speaking to Ezekiel, Thus you have said, now he's speaking on behalf of what the people are saying in exile, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? They're filled with despair, and rightly so. Israel was gone, Judah's now gone, they're in exile. I mean, they're no longer the people of God in the promised land. They have no temple upon which to sacrifice. They have no security of a wall to keep them as a people. They are filled with despair. Jeremiah had warned them. Jeremiah had said to them, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, listen, this is Jeremiah 11, they have turned, they have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. They will cry out to me, and God said, I will not listen. And the Babylonians came and swept them away. The reality of Jeremiah's prophecy now is their life. They heard the prophecy, and now they're experiencing the prophecy. They had lost their homes. They had lost their fields. They had lost their city. Many of them had lost loved ones. And so they say, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. There's finally some clarity. For too long, they had worshipped the idols. For too long, they had engaged in sin, thinking there will be no consequences. God will not act. And then God acted. And they finally are at that place where they needed to be before. Our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. It's our fault. It's our doing. Not God's. This statement, my beloved, is true for every man. This is not just the Babylonian ex, the Jews in exile. This is every one of us. Without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do you realize that at this very moment you are rotting away because of your sins? Your body is fastly decaying, and at some point in time it will give its last breath, and you will come before God, and you'll have to give an account. You will be judged for your sins, and then experience an eternity of rotting away. Now, you may be in a position in life right now like the exiles in Babylon, where you may be struggling, and you may be saying, you know, I know, I know my sins now. You may be living that prototypical American middle-class life, and all you're thinking about right now is for that man to stop talking so I can go to my Super Bowl party. I pray not. Either way, either way, without a Savior, to come and pay for your sins, you too can say, surely my transgressions and my sins are upon me and I am rotting away because of them. You can say that. And you know it's true. Every atheist, every Hindu, every Muslim, every Jew, every false professing Christian knows in their heart of hearts this is a true statement. We know it. Our conscience testifies to this. Our lives testify to this. Deep down in every heart, we know that we are ruined by our own sin. We know that we're rotting away. We know that our rebellion against God and our desire for our own glory defines us. It defines us. If you are there, 
If you have this realization and it is bringing a right conviction upon your heart, there is no better place to be. I don't care how long you profess Christ, how many times you've been baptized. This is glorious news today for every single soul that you know that apart from Christ you are rotting away and without the hope of the gospel that will be your end. This is pure gold. Verse 10 is pure gold. You say, well, it doesn't look like gold to me. He says, our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we rot away because of them. That doesn't sound like gold. That sounds like a nightmare. No man seeks help unless he knows he needs it. Right? No one goes to the doctor unless they think they're sick. No one, Nasser, where are you? No one goes through six rounds of chemotherapy unless he first knows he has cancer. You're not going to have your heart replaced unless you know you have heart disease, and if you don't have a replacement, you will die. So this is glorious news. This is the conviction that we want all people to have and understand. And they finally got it. They finally came to the right conclusion. It's because of us that we're here. We've lost our land. We lost the temple. We lost family. We're here because of us. And then they ask the operative question. Look at the end of verse 10. They say, how then can we live? It's asked in the context of the passage. It's asked rhetorically. They're not legitimately asking. They say, well, there's no hope. They're saying, we have no hope. There's no way that we're going to get a second chance on this. We've sealed our fate and the fate of our children and the fate of our grandchildren. We screwed up the covenant. God has left us. The land, the temple, the blessings, they are all lost. This is the impetus behind the question, but it is the question. Because what happens in verse 11? Look at verse 11. What happens? God, God speaks. God speaks and brings forth life and hope. Look at verse 11. God says to Ezekiel, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? This is God pleading, pleading. On his name, he says, it's surely, this is extraordinary. This floored me. He makes this truth claim of his desire for man to live. He says, as I live. There's no greater statement that the eternal living God could make about any truth claim than to say, as I live. How long has God lived? Forever and ever. He has always been. This is how serious we must take what he is saying in verse 11. As I live, I have no pleasure, God says, in the death of the wicked. It is a truth claim you must come to terms with when you contemplate God judging the unrepentant sinner. You must. Lest you impugn God of being unfair. Pastors, too many today refuse to talk about the holiness of God, the wrath of God, the consequences of an eternity in hell because somehow they think that impugns his character, that ruins God. As if somehow God sits up upon his throne and he sees men perishing and going to hell and God rejoices and God celebrates every time a man enters into the eternal flames. God said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that he, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's why he sent Jeremiah. That's why he sent Ezekiel. That's why he sends every watchman throughout the centuries, that we might hear the warning and we might live for his pleasure. He is pleased when we live. He is saying to the exiles, You're never hopeless on this side. It seemed hopeless to them. My beloved, there is no wickedness of any man's life, not yours, not your friend, not your parents, that is so wicked that God cannot overcome it in his pleasure to save. God's pleasure to save can overcome the wickedest of hearts and the wickedest of paths. So God says, he closes this passage Turn back. 
Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And that is the second consummate question. Why will you die? Why will you perish? God says, here's the watchman, here's the warning, here's the Savior, here's hope. Why are you going to die? Why will you spend an eternity in hell separated from me and my joy and all the blessings of heaven? Why would you do that? They lost their city, they lost their state, but he says, this is not your end. He's saying through the prophet Ezekiel, this does not have to be your end. My beloved, I don't know where you are right now with Christ, but I'm telling you right now, this does not have to be your end either. Death and destruction does not have to be your end. I'll make it even more clear. You don't have to die eternally. Your friends do not have to die eternally. Your family, your coworkers, your neighbor, the acquaintances who do not know Christ, regardless of their lives, regardless of what they've done, do not have to die. The God of the Bible is not only ready to show mercy to all who repent and believe and follow Christ, he takes pleasure in it. He rejoices in it. Great pleasure, great joy for those who will turn back from their evil ways, put their faith in Christ, and live. He takes joy in it because that's why he created us, that we might glorify him and enjoy him and him enjoying us. Oh, what a thought. What a thought. He is saying, death, if that is your path, is your choice. You must choose it. He is offering life to all who repent and believe. He's offering life by grace through faith in Christ. If you refuse to live, then you will die, and that is your choice. I know as Reformed people, we like to talk about God moving and God saving. When you perish, that's on you. 100%, you are fully culpable. And God says, it pleases me that you live, so do not die. God says, it pleases me that you live. So you have compelling reason to come back next Sunday and hear from the prophet Joel because I will, by God's grace, try to be a faithful watchman and I will preach to you from the word of God. You should gather next Sunday to listen to the prophet of Joel because you are fully responsible for your actions and your sins. You are. You will gather next Sunday to hear from the prophet Joel because God takes great pleasure in you living today and for eternity in his presence. Now I would be remiss if I do not close with these last few lines. You ought to gather here next Sunday and the Sunday after that to hear the word proclaimed because you too are a watchman. You have a mission field. There are people in your immediate proximity some family, some friends, some coworkers, some acquaintances, they have never heard the warning. They've never heard the trumpet. They've never heard the gospel. You believe Revelation 1-7, it says, Behold, he, Christ, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. And if you know Christ, you believe that. And therefore, you know that there are many that are under your watch care. We must individually and as a church be faithful to bring the gospel to those who do not know Christ, lest their blood be upon our hands. Amen? Let's pray. Father, these are such sobering verses. They call us as a people to see everything in light of eternity. That we are here for a moment. We are but grass. We are the vapors, Lord. And you are so gracious to send watchmen for centuries to give 
mankind the right warning to turn back and live. Father, I am so thankful for all those you've gathered here this morning in this church and your true churches throughout the South Bay that have heard that warning. They've repented and they believe and they are in Christ. And they can never be lost, Father. I pray that you would place that same burden upon their hearts that others had for us when they shared the gospel with us. That we would be bold in opening our mouths. We would think about those that we will see tomorrow those that have never heard the warning, and we will share with them you, our glorious God. We will share with them your majesty and your beauty. We will share with them the, the holy work of Christ, and we will share with them the need to repent and believe. Father, loosen our tongues, I pray you would. Let us be faithful watchmen in our community that people here might be saved as well. Father, bring us back next week that we might engage in this great means of grace, the proclamation of the gospel, me speaking, and my brothers and sisters listening, that we might hear you from the prophet Joel, so much to be heard, and in so doing, Lord, continue to transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit into the people that you desire us to be. We ask that you would do this great work, Lord, not for our benefit, but for Christ and his name, that it might be known here in the Cambrian Park community, both now and forever. Amen.